So I'm Roger Brown. I'm the president of Berkeley College of Music here in Boston. I've been in the job for a little over three years now. Well, I grew up in North Georgia. Uh, I was an avid drummer in a bunch of different bands, primarily a jazz fusion band. Released a couple of obscure records, played on some jingles in New York City, but my career took a different path and I ended up doing international relief and development work in Kenya as a school teacher in Cambodia and Thailand, distributing food relief to Cambodian refugees in the Sudan for a few years, working with Ethiopian and Eritrean refugees as well as people from Sudan. Uh, and then my wife and I, who met through this work, started a company which we ran for many years. All the while I was still writing and producing children's music. This was an early childhood education organization. Um, and then the Berkeley opportunity came open and I thought this would be fantastic. It's a place, you know, I'd, all the recording I'd done, the engineers, a lot of the musicians were Berkeley people. Whenever we needed a great horn player, the engineer would always find some Berkeley faculty member. Uh, I've, I've played in a, you know, a local band for years, and we always had Berkeley alumni in the band. So I, I knew a lot about the place. It, was, it felt like an honor to even think I might be considered for the job, and in fact, I got it. So I'm here. In the fifth grade, I started my first band. It was called Junior and the Jailbirds. I was junior. I'm Roger Henry Brown, Jr. And we played, our two tunes were um, Blowing in the Wind, the Bob Dylan anti-war anthem, and the other was the, 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 uh, the Ballad of the Green Beret, which is a pro-war anthem from the Vietnam era. We didn't really, we weren't politically sophisticated. We didn't realize there might be contradiction in our messages. But, uh, and ever since then, I've had bands everywhere I've been. I've had a band, I was in a gospel choir in Kenya and I played the drums for them. And I was in a, uh, a cover band in Thailand with guys who didn't speak any English but could sing word for word phonetically every hit of the day. Um, I was in a band in, in uh, Sudan and the guitar player, again, this guitar player could play Sultans of Swing, the Martin Offor solo, note for note. You know, this guy had never been out of Khartoum. So wherever you go, music is a way to connect with people. And I would always make it a point to learn some local folk songs that were you know, the, sort of the standard uh, uh, repertoire of any person in that culture. And you know, if, if, if you can break into songs singing something that everyone knows, they, they just love it. It's an amazing way to connect with people. And in some ways, the worse you sing and the worse your accent is, the better, because they, they recognize that you're trying. I think one of the most important things we did in, in, in the Cambodian refugee camps is that the Khmer Rouge, who had controlled Cambodia for many years, had not only squelched the country in, in the more obvious political ways, but they had, they had basically killed, exterminated the musicians of that society because they viewed them as bourgeois, leeches who were draining society of its, of its well-being. And it was a really radical society that didn't work, obviously. Not only did they kill musicians, they killed doctors and lawyers and anyone who had been educated. Uh, many of the musicians did survive by pretending not to be musicians, but the people had had none of their own music for four years by the time we got to this refugee camp in Thailand. So I had this rice warehouse, an old thatched hut full of big, huge 100-kilogram bags of rice, and it was the acoustics were fantastic. So I called for any of the musicians to come forward and we got just some, you know, standard uh, um, kind of boombox recording uh, equipment in there and we, we made CD, I mean, we made cassette tapes of their music, which really hadn't been played or heard for years. And I got the United Nations to agree to just print up some copies. We printed up a few thousand copies of this music and circulated in the, in the refugee camp and suddenly heard it everywhere. So instead of just hearing ABBA and Michael Jackson, you were now hearing the, the indigenous folk mu music of the Cambodian people. And you know, I felt like that did as much good for that society as all the rice and all the, the ag agricultural implements and other things that we were able to give to people who needed them. To me, music is the ultimate way to express yourself. I think that's what it's all about. That's why we have it. That's why it's persisted. Why it may have even preceded spoken language. There is a raging debate as to whether music is, is a, a, what was it called, a auditory cheesecake. That's what a, a brain researcher called it, that developed alongside language but was an accident. But I firmly believe that that's not the case. 
Uh, I think probably the earliest uses of music were as part of the oral tradition so that people could remember things. There are a lot of people with Alzheimer's who can't remember how to speak or can't, don't have memories, but they can sing lyrics uh, word for word. So music helps embed memory in people. And before written language and before history books and before records were kept, we had to have some way of knowing who we were, where we came from, who our family was, what we believed in, and all that was recorded and passed along from generation to generation, usually in epic poems or in song. So my theory is that the way culture actually got started was by passing cultural uh, archival material about who your, who your grandparents were and who their grandparents were and where you came from and what rivers you crossed and what famines you endured. And I think that was probably recorded in this music and epic poetry. Um, so the process of parents singing to their children is just totally baked into our, our hardwired into our, uh, our way of parenting and being. It's just so natural, even for people who themselves don't consider themselves musical, have never done anything overtly musical, they still sing to their children. Um, and there's a, there's a reason for that. I think that's the way we passed along um, you know, identity and culture to one another. Um, there's nothing like watching a group of three or four year olds. I, I got to know Raffi really well, who's, in my opinion, one of the foremost musicians of any kind who've, who's ever written. But when it comes to children's music, is really a quite, quite a gifted man. And his secret, if you watch a lot of children's entertainers, they jump around and they bounce around and they're very animated and they're very overstimulating. And the first time I saw Raffi, I, I'd heard about him and, and I had very young children at the time, a two and four year old, and I thought, wow, He's so calm. Are they going to get bored because he's not jumping around and acting zany like a clown? And what I realized is no, in fact, you know, the people who, who use that model, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. That's, a, that's another approach. But the Raffi approach is really a very deeply respectful way of seeing children as human beings and connecting with them and expressing emotion with and through them. So my sense is that, uh, you know, one of the things that causes a two-year-old to bite is that the two-year-old has a lot of understanding but doesn't yet have the developed language to express it. And that creates huge frustrations. And that year is one where, you know, often two-year-olds will tear things up or they'll bite. And a lot of that is about it, this frustration of having something you're dying to say to the world and no words to say it with. So to me, music is that for all of us. You know, when you can't, when you can't find any other way to express your frustration, music is the way you do that. And so for young children, Music is this amazing discovery that you can sing, you can hum, you can, you can make up your own lyrics. I think most children actually make up songs before someone tells them, oh, you're not a songwriter. Um, I, I still have two or three songs that my grandmother sang back to me that I had made up when I was a kid, which I refused to sing on camera. But, um, you know, I just think it's such an important part of how children grow and develop. Um, that, that we need to do everything we can to encourage parents to feel free to be amateur musicians and not worry about being tone deaf or forgetting the lyrics or making up new lyrics because let's face it, every song was made up by somebody sometime. So um, I think of music as a very powerful tool. And I guess an analog to that thought is if you think about what Berkeley's all about, we were established to teach jazz and the contemporary music of the 1940s, swing, big band. And we've progressed and added rock and roll and blues and, and R&B and Latin music, world music. Um, if you think about what those musics have in common, one of their f most fundamental elements is that they've often been the way that people express themselves who were marginalized in the societies they lived in. So the most obvious case are African Americans, especially in the American South, who were enslaved and treated brutally in almost every aspect of their lives and yet they created this magnificent music that we call the blues and ragtime and jazz that um, today is the dominant form of music that you listen to around the world. You know, go to Malaysia, go to Kenya, go to Moscow, you're going to hear blues-oriented music even if it's been interpreted by local artists and local musicians. So I think like the two-year-old who's, who's got something to say and has, has to find some way to say it, music has been that outlet for us. And you know, unfortunately for the people who don't find music, often they do bite and tear things up and there are destructive ways that gets expressed. 
But uh, to me, the, the beauty, especially the beauty of jazz and, and sort of the, the contemporary music of the Americas is that it, it really came out of um, a tough experience but was in some ways transmuted into this beautiful art form. My number one argument is, a, is the pragmatic argument. If you care about people doing well academically, being prepared for careers, you know, to have a successful life, the number one thing you need to do is find something that gives them energy, that lights them up, that makes them feel animated. Because you know, a sullen child sitting in a classroom being drilled on algebra isn't going to happen. All the studies about education and learning show us that it's the motivation of the teacher and the motivation of the learner that have the most to do with whether the person learns. So there's this famous study done of foreign language learning that looked at total immersion and old-fashioned grammar, drill and repeat, learn vocabulary. And what they found is that either method worked beautifully if the student was motivated. And the, the, the thing that correlated most with the student's motivation was, was the teacher motivated. So if the teacher loves new methods, that probably works better. If the teacher likes old methods, that may work fine. Um, so the number one reason to teach music in schools is there, is there are a lot of students for whom that's the pathway to, to opening them up to the idea of learning in the first place. So when you, when you practice an instrument every day, it gives you discipline. When you play in an ensemble, you learn to work with other people. When you learn to read music, you're learning a new language, and every language you learn makes the next one you learn easier. You get, you get tapped into these deep traditions, like the jazz tradition or the European classical music tradition, that, that make you interested in the history. Like, where did the blues come from? Suddenly, American history is interesting to me. What was Bach all about? Well, suddenly, you know, Europe uh, 300, 400 years ago is interesting to me. Um, so, I think, number one, it's, it's, it's a, a very useful tool for helping everyone feel connected to their history and, and, and have some motivation for learning. But, but there are also some examples of people, I and mean, there's, there's an interesting story I remember reading. I was reading an, uh, a biography of John Coltrane who said that his most formative in musical influence outside his family was his high school music teacher. And John Coltrane grew up in Hamlet, North Carolina, in the middle of the sort of worst period of Jim Crow segregation, when the schools of North Carolina were terrible for all students, but particularly for black students. And yet, that school somehow found a way to make available to him a music teacher who was more influential than anyone he ever studied with subsequently. So the fact that Boston, Massachusetts, or Los Angeles, California, with all the wealth we have, cannot make available simple music teachers to students who have the kind of gifts that a John Coltrane has is just is, is criminal. So even if you're, you know, I would argue to a pragmatist, you need to do it because it motivates people to learn and maybe then they'll get more interested in history or math or science. But at a deeper level, you know, a more um, spiritual level, I think we need to do it because you know, a, lot of, a lot of the spiritual um, strength of people resides in ways that can't be reached necessarily through academics. Or And then a final point of view I have is that the two things that, if you're a great student today in an American inner city school, if you do really well on SAT kind of tests, you're going to get plucked out of that system and you're going to go to Harvard or Stanford or Yale and you're going to be fine. If you're not, then the system is, has become so focused on high stakes testing and on academic achievement that there's not much left for you. And many of the people I know who've been the most successful entrepreneurs or, or you know, in other parts of their lives weren't great students, but they were great athletes or they were great musicians. And athletics and music had been the two things that kept people who hated school willing to come to show up and at least finish. And I think when you take away athletics and music, which is part of what's happening in America today, you take away the two magnets that were the things that kept the, the mediocre student who had amazing gifts, the person who might have dyslexia or some kind of you know, learning, learning uh, dis, uh, disabilities or some impediment to their learning, but it, 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 uh, it masks a deeper kind of intelligence that could get manifest in some other way in the world, like starting a great company or like writing a brilliant piece of music or writing a great novel. So many of the people who do those things weren't great students getting A pluses in every class. Berkeley was started in 1945 by a man named Larry Burke, who was an MIT trained engineer, and he was enamored, he was also a great pianist and an arranger, and he was enamored by this method of studying music called the Schillinger method, uh, that was formulated by a Russian mathematician named Joseph Schillinger. 
He's very analytical, and Larry himself was an analytical person, so he started this school to train young musicians not to study classical music, but to study jazz and swing and big band music, the music of the day that he was enamored of. And that was a radical idea back in 1945, because a lot of people thought, A, that jazz wasn't a legitimate form of music, B, that it was corrupting our young people, C, that you, even if you liked it, you couldn't teach it, that you had to learn it, you know, uh, person to person in the street, that there was no formal way to think about it or teach it. And Larry rejected all those ideas and said, absolutely, it's legitimate music, it's wonderful music. And, you know, it's, I think now most people recognize that it really is America's great contribution to world culture and art. Um, but he also said, I think there is a way you can teach it. So it, then it, it, it was started sort of like a private studio of Larry Burke, and then in the 60s, the, the Burke family actually made it into a nonprofit it became accredited to grant degrees and started offering a, a four-year college degree as, in a Bachelor of Music. And Larry's son, Lee, took over. And the thing about Berkeley, that I, the, the, the key element of our legacy that I want to make sure that I maintain as president is that we did things 10, 20, 30 years before anybody else thought that they could or should be done. So we taught jazz in 1945. I dare say there was no conservatory on the face of the earth in fact, I know people in conservatories who got thrown out for playing jazz. Their teachers would say, that's going to ruin you. Don't play that music. So that was radical. In the 1960s, we embraced the electric guitar before the Beatles, and our enrollment exploded because we suddenly were the only place in America where if you were serious about music, you could study electric guitar. And of course, we've gone on to produce people like John Schofield and Mike Stern and Kevin Eubanks and... Mick Goodrick and Pat Metheny was a faculty member here because, because we were ahead of the curve. Then also in the early 70s probably, I guess is the, is the seminal moment, we embraced music technology when m most musicians were saying, this is going to put us out of work, this is horrible stuff, it's going to dumb down music, we shouldn't embrace it, we should resist it. But Berkeley, you know, knowing that some of those arguments are legitimate, technology actually can dumb down music if you don't use it properly, but so can anything else. <laughs> You know, a guitar played by a person who's not good at playing the guitar doesn't necessarily sound good. So technology is just a tool. Berkeley had the guts to say, no, we're going to embrace technology. So we embraced, we embraced it both in, in electronic instruments and synthesizers, but also the creation of music synthesis. We have a music synthesis department and have, I think, longer than any other institution. And also production and engineering and seeing the interconnectedness of the way you record music and how music is shaped and evolves. So in my mind, the big legacy of the institution is that we've embraced change and we've been willing to be on the cutting edge. We've been willing to be wrong sometimes. You know, we've been willing to take risks. So again, I don't know of any other conservatory or college that teaches music that's embraced hip hop the way we have. We have a, a, a course in turntablism. We've tried to codify the techniques of turntablists so that that, that can be transmitted and shared with people around the world. Uh, we have an online school that outreaches to people in you know, remote corners of the world who will never be able to come to an American conservatory and study jazz, but they can get some of the secret sauce online. So I think it's got a very proud heritage and uh, it's an honor to be trying to lead it into the next century. There are three things we're looking for. We want innovators, people who are going to be creative, not people who will just recapitulate the past. We want people with deep musical aptitude, and we want people with huge motivation. Those are the three things we're looking for. If you've got those three things, but you can't sight read, or your technique is a little flawed, or you play some weird instrument in some weird way and you have weird tone, or you know, you're not the best improviser yet, but we can see that you've got interesting ideas, or you can't really play or sing, but you're a great writer, you know, you've got something to say, um, that's what we're looking for, is people who are going to be the next innovators. You know, we, we, want, we want to be educating the people who, who all the other institutions will be studying 40 years from now. Um, and what we, what we like to think of is it, it, not to be too audacious, but um, you, know, you look at the history of other arts and sciences. Uh, you know, I was a physics major in college, and Germany at the turn of the last century was this amazing hotbed of scientists. In fact, Albert Einstein and Werner Heisenberg went to the same high school in Munich, and they produced this raft of amazing physics at the turn of the last century. 
So there's something magic that happens when you bring together very passionate people in one place and, and, and get them focused on something. So our hope is that some Brazilian guitar player and some Chinese percussionist hook up with some Icelandic vocalist and they create something that didn't exist before in one of our dorm rooms. Um, and you know, it might be happening right now for all we know. Probably not, probably not right now, it's probably a little early for that. But. It's not too dissimilar. You know, we look for faculty who want to teach students who are really gifted, very innovative, and very motivated. Uh, that takes a slightly different kind of person because unfortunately the way music is often taught is as if the, uh, all the innovators have already existed and our job is just to recapitulate what they've done and learn it. So we need to find faculty who are willing to have students who challenge them, who play differently. Now I'm fond of saying I want to make sure that we would admit Ornette Coleman if he applied to Berkeley, or we would admit John Lennon if he applied to Berkeley, or Laurie Anderson if she applied to Berkeley, and yet all three of those people are very unconventional, and in most music schools they'd get thrown out on their ear because they don't play the right way, or they don't, you know, they, 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 they kind of they marched a different drummer. So we need faculty who are open and willing to to imagine with the student what they might become, as opposed to say, this is, what, this is my vision for what you need to do. Ideally, we want people who, are, um, who have a foot in the, in the real world of music, you know, people who are performing or writing or touring or you know, ha have some, some sense for what's happening in the music world. One of the things that was great about Berkeley in its early days is I'm told that uh, you know, Lionel Hampton or Woody Herman or Buddy Rich would come through here and hire half his band and they'd all go on the road. Um, and that still happens. We have a lot of Art Blakey um, uh, alumni at Berkeley and there's still bands who will come through here and uh, you know Christine Aguilera's band now is led by a Berkeley alum. Um, so w w we like the idea that a faculty member has that connection to the real world and, and can also give the students some practical tips for how you make it as a musician. Because one other distinctive thing about Berkeley is that we're not prepared to throw in the towel and say study music so you can be good at something else. Now that's, that's true, and I'll make that argument for a million years to parents that lawyers and software engineers who study music are probably going to be better at their craft, but we're about helping people who are serious about music find a career in music, and not just a short-term career, but a long-term career. So our curriculum is designed to give students the tools that they'll need for a 40 or 50 year career with all the changes that are likely to happen. Um, so. You know, a faculty member who's, who's got some real-world experience can, can give better advice than someone who's simply been a, a, more of an ivory tower music teacher. I would say if we're going to err, we're going to err on the side of practice. Um, but, you know, there's so many things in, in life, and we in the Western world have a hard time with this, where there is a yin and a yang. And all practice with no theory can be deadening. But all theory with no practice can be just totally irrelevant. So I think the job of any good institution is to hold those two con contradictory things in balance and say, yes, you need to, you need to do your, your harmony classes, your theory classes, your ear training classes. You need to learn to write a fugue, even though you're, you're not intending to be a film composer or a classical composer. These things are tools that will help you be a better musician and understand music and unleash whatever talents you have more effectively. So we need to emphasize the theory part. And to the typical Berkeley student, that's a little bit of a hard sell because they're here to play. They want to play eight hours a day and then they want to go out and have a gig that night and then they want to come back and practice all, you know, till four in the morning, uh, which is great. But I also think that if, if that's all you do, you don't develop as well. There really are some things that you can do away from your instrument that can help you become a better musician. Uh, Having come from the world of virtually all practice and no theory, <laughs> I think I'm living proof of how limited you, 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 you cause yourself to be when you don't make that leap. I mean, it's interesting to me to see um, some of the people who've come out of Berkeley, uh, you know, a, a good example I think is an Alan Silvestri, who was a rock and roll musician who came to Berkeley and his goal was to be a rock and roll musician. But he got a big break and started scoring movies, and he just, you know, he did Forrest Gump, he did Back to the Future, he's doing this Beowulf movie now. He's calling on skills he never would have imagined he would use. If he had been at Berkeley and said, look, I'm just a rock and roll musician, I don't want to, I don't want to learn all this stuff, how could, he, how could he compose the music he's composed 
for these amazing films he's done. So part of our ch challenge, I think, is to get the young 20-year-old you know, person who's just got this, this incredibly uh, focused, laser-like goal and say, that's, that's cool, we're going to support you in that, but you also are here to kind of open your mind and open your ears to new things you haven't heard before, things you haven't considered doing before, so that when you go out there, you'll have a toolkit that serves you well. Um, you know, a lot of, I'm a, I'm a drummer, a lot of Berkeley drummers are, are distinguished by the fact that they're musical directors. They actually, they know enough about music to think about the melodic side of the, of, of the music and the business side of the music. And uh, it's pretty rare to find drummers in, in an MD role because most of them just don't have the chops in, in other arenas. I heard a great clinician here say, uh, better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. I don't think it's important for all musicians to. I still think there are some people whose job in life is just to create and they don't have a business mind, they don't want to have a business mind, they think it's going to detract from their pursuit of their art, and, and that's legitimate. So I'm not of the school that says everybody has to be a business person and an entrepreneur. On the other hand, there are a lot of people for whom those skills are both interesting and important because it will help them guide and manage their careers properly. And I can't tell you how many musicians who are out 20 years say, man, I wish I'd known something about publishing when I started. I wish I'd known how to read a contract. I wish I'd known when to ask for help. I was just so eager and I just did whatever they told me to do and it was a mistake. I think the typical student who comes out of Berkeley has been schooled in how to not make those mistakes. It's still very tempting. You know, when someone sticks something in front of you that you think might make your career, it's very tempting to just pick up the pen and sign it. But I think we prepare students to have more insight into what's going on in the world, to think about strategically about their careers, how to manage their careers. If you think about it, the, the record companies used to have three key functions. They used to provide the upfront capital that was required to get you to go into a very expensive studio for weeks, months, years, and make you know, a really wonderful sounding record. Then they used to provide the distribution to get that record into the stores in every nook and cranny of, of the world so when you finally heard it on the radio, you could buy it. And then they provided the marketing and the promotion that caused you to actually hear of the thing and to read about it and to hear it on the radio so that that would stimulate you to want to go buy it. Well, with the advent of new recording technology, you don't need as much money to make a record, and you can make it on your own, and you can probably be your own producer and your own engineer if you've got those kind of chops, which is something we also teach at Berkeley. You don't need the distribution anymore because you can put it up online and people can have it instantaneously at no cost. You know, the friction of distributing music is gone, for good and bad. What you still need, though, is the marketing and promotion. And you need it more than ever because there's now more high quality music floating around in the ether than there ever was. And there's no way for people to find out about it. And there's no way for it to develop momentum and critical mass unless you have some marketing and promotion ideas. So the thing I'm encouraging Berkeley students to think about are innovative ways to get the world to know they exist and to hear their music. One of the things I'm optimistic about is that, you know, touring and clubs and live music have been on the decline for the last 20 years or so, for lots of reasons we could talk about. But I think this new model is gonna make it necessary for young musicians to get out on the road and get in front of an audience and have something appealing, visually interesting, memorable to say and do as a musician to get someone to wanna to then go download their music. I have an interesting story. Um, there's a great friend of mine who I grew up with. We played football together named Bruce Birch. Um, He's now head of the music business department at the University of Georgia. And to my knowledge, Bruce didn't play a lot of music in high school. I was like in the musician group, and I was in a bunch of different bands. But he, he fell in love with Chris Christopherson somewhere along the way and decided he wanted to be a songwriter, and he taught himself to play the guitar, and he, taught him, he listened to a lot of music, and he went on and had a very successful career. And I remember thinking, that guy had some real guts. Uh, to, to think, to have the, the audacity to say, I can do this. And I think he worked in a hot dog stand. It's one of those classic Nashville stories. He worked for seven or ten years and had no breaks and was earning a living you know, managing a hot dog restaurant. But then he had some breakthroughs and had a bunch of number one hits. And So I guess what that story tells me is the music business is bigger, stronger, um, more lucrative than most people imagine it is. 
Most people say either I'm going to become you two or I'm not. And they don't understand that there are a million other options, a million other niches in the industry of writing for video games or writing for television or arranging or, or uh, you know, per performing, of course. But uh, all the business jobs, you know, all the new companies that are getting created to take advantage of the internet and these new distribution models and new promotion models. So my advice is search your soul, and if it's something you think you're really interested in, it's not just something that you want to do because you're afraid of doing something else. But if you're really serious about it, go for it because it's a big world. You know, the industry is big and rich, and, and despite the fact that certain parts of it are, that are very visible are shrinking, overall, the amount of the number of people earning money in music and the amount of money they're earning has been growing, despite the fact that record companies have been shrinking and some of the artists have been have found their sales shrinking of, of recorded music, the field is still exploding. And nothing that's happened has indicated that people are less interested in music. There's you know, film, TV, and video games are more music rich than they've ever been, and there's a hundred times the content being created than there was when we were kids. I talk to parents all the time about, about music school, and it's a terrifying prospect for most parents. I think it's particularly terrifying when Berkeley is the, is the place they're thinking about, because their image of Berkeley is this sort of cutting edge, innovative place. It doesn't have the, the sort of well-tended English garden dimensions of a conservatory. It feels more like an Amazonian rainforest where there's immense biodiversity, but also some creatures out there that might kill you. So I talked to a lot of parents about this, um, and I'm fond of telling this story that Livingston Taylor, one of our faculty members, tells. He, he, he is a resident advisor at Harvard, and he's a faculty member at Berkeley. And he said, when a young person gets accepted to Harvard, it's the result of 18 years of concerted effort on the part of the entire extended family to get that young person into Harvard. When a young person comes to Berkeley, it's usually after, you know, a bunch of... Uh, resistance on the part of the entire extended family. They've had to overcome the, the people who say, do you really want to do that? Is that really the career you want? Is that what you're dreaming of? Um, are you serious about it? But the key message I give to parents is this. 80% uh, of our alumni five years out are working in music, making at least half their income in music, and 55% are making all their income in music. I dare say there's no English literature program in America, no history program, no political science program that can make that claim, that 55% of the graduates of this political science program are making their living in political science. So first, we're a good place to go if you're serious about music. Secondly, even if you decide not to do music, there's nothing that says because you've studied music you're condemned to forever be unemployed or not be able to do anything else. So we have students who go to business school, students who go to law school, we have a student getting a PhD at MIT. We have a student who was admitted to Harvard Medical School but decided to actually go uh, do some other things first. Um, the graduate schools our kids go to look like a who's who of, of the best graduate schools in the country. Some are in music, but others are in, you know, we have academics. Um, so the, the, I think the key question is, what is a good education to have in a world that's changing so fast? And in a world that's changing so fast, you need to have the ability to learn new skills. And there's nothing like the discipline of practicing an instrument every day for 90 minutes or a couple of hours to allow you to learn a new skill. So let's say that some new software program comes along and you need to learn it. If you know how to learn your instrument, you know how to apply those same skills to learning, skills to learning that, that, that software program. Um, I think the biggest thing businesses tell us is that what they're looking for in people is the ability to work in teams of people with multiple skills. Well, there's no better team with, of people with multiple skills that you can practice on than an ensemble of you know, people, a drummer from Argentina and a guitar player from Switzerland and a bass player from New Orleans, and you've got to pull it all together and help make it sound good. You learn how to negotiate, you learn how to give feedback, you learn how to receive feedback, you learn how to assert your leadership, you learn when to listen. You know, all those skills that are very important in working in teams, you get in an ensemble setting. And ensembles are the, the heart of the Berkeley experience. You immediately get put in an ensemble and you are playing music with other people from the instant you get here. Um, if you learn to compose you know, and do the problem solving that's required with composing and arranging of you know, four-part uh, harmonies and big horn lines in a big band setting or 
or a, a Bach style classical fugue. Um, you know, you're learning analytical skills that can serve you in anything you do in life. Uh, certainly, I think composition is a great analog for software engineering, which is one of the hottest professions in, in, in the land. And then finally, you know, we talked a lot about innovation and creativity. I think if you go to an institution that encourages you to be a creative person as opposed to discourages that and says, you know, A, B, C, D, E, just learn, just learn by rote, you're going to be much better prepared to start a new business, start a new job, have a new idea, create something that didn't exist before. And in the new economy, I think everyone agrees there's a primacy put on innovation. So I think going to a place like Berkeley where you're encouraged not to just learn the old songs but to write some new ones is great preparation for that economy. We've got so many goals that it's hard to, uh, hard to distill them, but I'm going to try to. I'd say there's a category of, of cultural goals that we have, and that, those go, go to this idea that we want to be the place where the new music gets created. So what do we need to do to be that place? We need more common areas for students to be together so they get to know each other better. We need more venues where they can play music, practice music, perform to live audiences to test their ideas out on other people. They need to be in touch with clinicians who inspire them, people out in the world who are doing interesting things. They need a diversity of, like a diet, you know, we, we want people to sample all the food groups of musical styles. So they're not, they don't come here as an R&B musician and leave having never thought about doing anything else. Maybe that's the path they should be on, but maybe, lo and behold, it turns out they, they want to be a composer. So, you know, I think with that big goal in mind, what do you do to, to, to imagine the kind of school where, where you know, the, the collaborations can happen, where, where new ideas happen and new music gets created? So then from that vision, we have all sorts of practical things we're doing. We're buying and building some new facilities that include more ensemble spaces, more dormitory spaces, more common area for students to practice in, dormitories that have easy, convenient practice and instrument storage uh, right uh, adjacent to them. Um, a brand new music technology facility that will be, uh, you know, frankly, I think we are state of the art, but that's largely because not many other people are focused on it. We want to be the place that has the best tools for a young aspiring music technologist because that is a huge point of differentiation between us and most conservatories. Um, and I believe that uh, even though technology is, is a tool, tools affect function. I mean, you can, you can usually tell a songwriter who composes on the piano versus one who composes on a guitar. But there are new composers who are using laptops, and they're using music software. And that will, you know, without a doubt, affect the kind of music that gets created. And again, we want to be at the leading edge of that, and that requires some investments in, in technology and facilities to help that happen. The number one thing I'm focused on is raising money so we can offer scholarships to people who come from low-income backgrounds, both domestically in the United States but all over the world, so that we can get the finest young musicians to come to Berkeley, whether their families have money or not. So we have raised a bunch of money and we have dramatically augmented the amount of scholarships we offer. The other thing we're doing uh, that I hope we'll be doing even more of five years from now is we have a program that, that tries to fill this gap that's been created in our public school system. It's called City Music, in which we go out to middle schools and high schools and recruit aspiring musicians, and we give them a lesson, put them in an ensemble, and teach them music theory. And we do that during the school year, and then if they're motivated and do well, we bring them to our summer program as a high school student at no cost to the family. And if they do it well at that, we give them a full scholarship to the college. So we now have 22 students here on full scholarships who came through this program. And when they get here, on average, they place out of uh, a lot of the introductory classwork because they've already had exposure to it. They're actually more apt to graduate from Berkeley than the typical student, so they're very well prepared to be here. And so we're providing not only the, the financial access to students from low-income backgrounds, but also the tools to be prepared to succeed when you get here. Because if you've never studied music, if you've never had any exposure to reading music, then the first year or two of Berkeley can be a long haul. But if you've gotten that as a middle school and a high school student, then it's demystified. So I'd say those three things, the kind of facilities and community to support innovation, 
a scholarship program to make the place accessible to whoever should and needs to be here, and then outreach to young people who might not be exposed to music or might not develop the, the skills that would allow them to succeed here. You know, I wish people would read more music history. It is so popular today to whine and complain about how horrible the industry is. But when I read music history, I think people have been whining and complaining about this industry since the, the dawn of time. Um, and, you know, it's a tough, it's a tough field. You know, it's a tough, it's not only tough financially, it's tough to write something and put yourself, pour your heart into it and offer it up to people who might like or not like it. And it requires a kind of vulnerability and honesty that most human beings are just not cut out for. So it is a tough field. Let's just accept that. Um, but, you know, there were, you know there, were, there were strikes. There were periods during which no music was released, I think at the you know, end of World War II. Uh, there were times when even the, the musicians we revere and admire most today were just absolutely destitute. Couldn't get, couldn't get paid enough money for a gig to survive. I mean, one of, the, one of the faculty members who was in one of the most popular big bands of the, of the 50s and 60s said, you know, we rode on a bus and we got given enough money for food each day and we, har you know, we, we hardly ever got any mon real money. And if you complained, they'd throw you out of the band and go hire somebody else. He said, the good old days were not really that good. So I am optimistic. And I meet alumni every day who have found some bizarre little niche of the industry doing sound design for sound effects for some movie studio. And, I, you know, you think, oh, I guess someone does have to create that raindrop sound or that, the sound of the, the, you know, the ship crashing into a, a, an iceberg, you know. And someone gets paid to do that. And uh, so I'm, I'm actually very optimistic about, about where things are going. I'd be pessimistic if I looked around and people were not listening to music. If something had happened and culturally we no longer needed it. But the amount of music people listen to, the ways we have found, the ingenious ways we found to take music with us everywhere are, are extraordinary. And what it confirms to me is that human beings want and love music and they will find ways to have it.